We're in the book of 1 Timothy this morning, and um, let me just say that our teaching pastors, uh, Pastor Neil is in uh, Mobile, Alabama this morning, maybe on his way back by now, but he was over at the Calvary Chapel in Mobile. Neil has this unique ability to be kind of a magnet for other churches, uh, I saw him do that in Destin. He kind of brought all the churches together down in Destin, Florida to do things. And he's done that here locally, but he's also done it in terms of our Calvary Chapel churches all the way from Gulfport, Mississippi down to Panama City Beach, Florida. And there are 10 or 12 churches that are Calvary chapels in that span of space along our coastline. And so Neil has brought those guys together. They come here and uh, we get to fellowship with them on occasion, about once every quarter. And so uh, Neil is over in Mobile this morning, a Calvary Chapel that is growing, that is active there, that just moved into a new building. So pretty significant thing for them, and they invited Neil to be a part of that. Uh, Pastor John is teaching at a couple of conferences this week. So he flew out first thing this morning, and then there's me. And I just keep coming back like a bad habit. <laughs> but I enjoy doing it. So uh, um, we're in 1 Timothy. And here's something interesting right up front about 1 Timothy. Every single book in the Bible that starts with the word T, or starts with the letter T, is grouped together. Did you know that? No other T's in the Bible except for right here, Second Thessal uh, First and Second Thessalonians, First and Second Timothy, and the book of Titus all grouped together in the New Testament. And I'm thinking some of you probably knew that, but let me give you something you might not know. These books are listed in alphabetical order. Now, is that significant? I honestly don't know. But I know who does. Pastor Neil does. So call him tomorrow morning. <laughs> give him a ring. I'm sure he'd be glad to talk to you and give you a reason for that. So if you're in 1 Timothy, say, got it. Okay, good, good. Chuck Swindoll, a Christian pastor, teacher, and evangelist, said this about Paul's first letter to Timothy. First Timothy represents the most explicit and complete instructions for church leadership and organization in the entire Bible. This includes sections on appropriate conduct in worship gatherings, the qualifications of elders and deacons, and the proper order of church discipline. Jim Gallagher, the pastor of Calvary Chapel in Vero Beach, Florida, said this, Until the writing of the pastoral epistle, epistles, of which 1 Timothy is one, until the writing of those epistles, the church had no ecclesiology. And what that term means is that there were really no written instructions or structure to follow concerning the life of the church or the operation of the church. So I say this to say this, this is pretty important stuff that we're getting into this morning. And my job is just to give you an overview of 1 Timothy uh, Pastor Neil will be starting with chapter 1, verse 1 next week as we come together. But the epistles, these letters in the New Testament in general, were written to document and communicate the doctrines of the church, how everything operates in the church. So what you and I will be reading about and learning about in our verse-by-verse -verse studies through this letter, and then the subsequent letter, our second letter written to Timothy, is what our church, Coastline Calvary Chapel, and other churches that name the name of Jesus Christ should look like, doctrinally speaking. Now, some of the questions that are answered specifically in this letter. Who is Jesus Christ in relation to the church? 
important topic. What is the purpose of the church? And how is that purpose carried out by the church day to day? What is godliness? And how should our church pursue godliness? And how should we model it for the community around us? What are the roles of men and women in the church? What's to be taught in the church? And what do we do when somebody steps outside of those guidelines? Who qualifies for positions of leadership in the church? And how does the church care for those who are widows? Now, we're not going to get to all of those this morning. But we certainly will get through the letter verse by verse as our pastors teach through it in the coming weeks. So be here for that. So we can look at this letter as an instruction book, if you will, for churches to follow. A set of plans to adhere to or to hold fast to. That's our theme for this study through 1 Timothy, holding fast to those things we know. And that's important because we're in a culture right now that's constantly changing and constantly challenging those things that we know to be true based on God's Word. So let me pray for our time together, and we're, we're going to go through this really quickly. And, and the way I'm going to do it is just hit some of the doctrinal information and give you a bunch of verses of Scripture. So you can quickly flip there if you'd like. I'll have some of them on the screen. You can jot them down if you'd like to. Uh, but important stuff that we're going through this morning concerning the church of Jesus Christ. Let me pray for our time together. Father God, we thank you for bringing us together this morning as a church. Lord, we are the church, and you've got a lot to say about the church in this letter to to Timothy. And we want to grab hold of those truths this morning, Lord. I pray that you would give us the ability to set aside those things that would kind of come into our mind and occupy our mind. The enemy tries to distract us during times like this. Lord, I pray that you would give us the ability to focus in on you and to focus in on your word for this short period of time, knowing that we're right where we're supposed to be. Lord, we're right in the center of your will for the next half hour. So we pray that you would speak to us, pray that you would encourage us, pray that you would help us to develop a lifestyle of godly living, and we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. So here's a brief outline that I'll be following for those of you that are kind of organized in that way. First, the basics, including the main characters of the letter the setting and the time in which it was written, the reason the letter was written, and an overview of those doctrinal matters that are addressed for us in this letter. So 1 Timothy carries the name of the addressee. The letter was written to Timothy by the Apostle Paul, And in addition to our Savior, Jesus Christ, Timothy and Paul are really the main characters of this letter. Now, Paul was previously known as Saul of Tarsus. He was a Pharisee. He was a Jewish zealot who persecuted the early followers of Jesus. He was also one of the official witnesses as a disciple named Stephen was killed. He was stoned to death, and he became the first martyr of the Christian faith. The book of Acts tells us that the risen Jesus Christ appeared to Paul personally as he was on the road to Damascus, and he was on a mission. He was looking for Christian followers so that he could bring them back to Jerusalem in chains. He was going after these guys. Man, I thought I had an intense come-to-Jesus meeting one time in my life, but 
What Paul experienced is crazy. Listen to this. It's from Acts chapter 9. As he was nearing Damascus on this mission that he was on, a brilliant light from heaven suddenly beamed down upon him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked, and the voice replied, I am Jesus, the one you are persecuting. Now, after this encounter, Saul becomes Paul, whom we know as a follower of Jesus Christ, a missionary, an early church planter, and a church leader. He's also responsible for over half of what we have in the Bible as the New Testament. Now, Timothy is referred to in Paul's introduction as his true child in the faith. And it's interesting, um, never really thought about this before, but this terminology describes my relationship with Pastor John. I mean, I'm his true child in the faith. And this is one of those things, if you know, you know, uh, some of you do know, some of you have been around for a long time. Uh, if you don't know, let me just share a little bit of my story with you. I found this church while Anna and I were visiting Gulf Breeze, looking for a place to live. I'd already taken a job here to get kind of get back out on the coast to begin with, but also to continue climbing the ladder in a career path in medical administration. That's what I did back then. It was a Saturday morning. We were with a real estate agent kind of looking at possible homes in the area. And I literally saw a sign from God. It was right down here on the corner of Oriole Beach Road and Oriole Beach Drive. And it said, New Life Christian Fellowship. That was the name of the church at that time. And it was a church that needed a sign because it was tucked back away in the woods here. I mean, this property hasn't always been developed like this. Uh, it was those two buildings that kind of run east and west, and it was a driveway that came off of Oriole Beach Drive instead of Oriole Beach Road. And literally, these neighborhoods around us, I've had a front row seat and kind of watching them develop over the years. It was pretty much woods back here at that time. So, long story short, Pastor John gave me the opportunity to use the gift of administration, which God gave me very clearly here at the church. And it was 29 years ago this coming Wednesday that I showed up here for my first day on staff. So, Pastor John invited me to serve in the ministry here. He trained me how to be a servant leader in the church environment. He ordained me for a life of service to the Lord and to his church. And then on top of all that, he taught me God's word. So we, we've never really described our relationship in these words, but as I read those words, I said, man, that seems to fit. So Timothy whose name appears throughout the New Testament letters, is thought to be around 40 years old at the time of the writing. He was 20 years younger than Paul. And that fits, too, because I'm 20 years younger than Pastor John. <laughs> no, I'm not really. I wish I was. And Timothy was working in Ephesus where Paul had left him to oversee a church. Timothy was recruited as Paul's traveling partner, uh, partner during Paul's second missionary journey. And he was chosen based on, first of all, his Christian heritage. His mother and his grandmother were believers, so they knew that Timothy had been brought up in the Christian faith. Then there was the mutual respect of the early disciples. They all spoke well of this guy, Timothy. They knew who he was. And then Paul made these kind of independent observations of his character qualities. And Paul said, man, this is a good guy for me to travel with, for a good guy to be on my team. 
And the relationship came at an interesting time on the heels of Paul split with Barnabas. You may remember that story. We're not going to get into it this morning. But Barnabas was his close friend and ministry partner, and they kind of parted ways at a particular time. And so Paul at that time kind of picked up Timothy as a new ministry partner. Now, the church at Ephesus, by all accounts, was a healthy and a thriving church, and it was responsible for planting several other churches, about seven in fact, in that specific region. And the third and final main character of this short letter is our Savior Jesus Christ. So we've got Paul, we've got Timothy, we've got Jesus. Aren't you glad we get to talk about Jesus in church? And we will, but for now, we're going to wait and kind of share what this letter has to say about Jesus as we talk about the doctrinal things, the matters of doctrine that specifically are shared in this letter. Christology, the study of Jesus Christ, is one of those. So we'll talk about Jesus at that point. First Timothy fits into three different categories as far as books of the Bible. It's an epistle. We've talked about that term. That's a letter that was written to the early churches or to an early church. It's a Pauline epistle because it was written by the Apostle Paul. And then it's a pastoral epistle as well, a letter written to a pastor or an overseer of a church. And it's very interesting that 1 Timothy was likely written in Macedonia, considering the city's role in Paul's conversion. It was on the road there that, that Jesus appeared to Paul and really transformed his life. Now, the time frame would have been around 60 years after the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And the story here follows the narrative in the book of Acts. And in Paul's life particularly, this letter was written between his imprisonment in Rome and the time of his death. So it was very late in the life of Paul. He's kind of sharing his final thoughts here, specifically with Timothy, but with the church as well. And the purpose of the letter was threefold to encourage Timothy in the oversight of the church at Ephesus. Second, to speak correction into some specific areas of doctrine, things that weren't going well in the church at Ephesus. We'll find that one of those specifically was false teachers. And to give organization and structure not only to this church, but also to the early churches as a whole. So that's kind of the setting of 1 Timothy. Now let's find out what the letter says. The first doctrinal matter that Paul gives Timothy instruction on is called Christology. And Christology is very simply the study of Christ. More formally, it's a branch of Christian theology that's related to the person, the nature, and the role of Christ, specifically with regard to the church. Now, we've already identified Paul and Timothy as two of the main characters. But in truth, Jesus Christ is the prominent figure in this letter. Christ is the head of the church. And 1 Timothy is all about proper function in the church. To the church at Colossae, Paul wrote this, Christ is also the head of the church, which is his body. He is the beginning, supreme over all who rise from the dead. So he is first in everything. What does 1 Timothy teach us about Jesus? Well, first we see Jesus as king and Lord. Listen to these verses. This is from Paul's introduction. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 2. May God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord give you grace, mercy, and peace. See, Paul, right from the beginning, makes clear that it's Jesus that is Lord over the church. 
He's the long-awaited Messiah. He is the Christ. 1 Timothy 5, 15, and 16 says this, At just the right time, Christ will be revealed from heaven by the blessed and only Almighty God, the King of all kings and the Lord of all lords. He alone can never die, and he lives in light so brilliant that no human can approach him. No human eye has ever seen him, nor ever will. All honor and power to him forever. Amen. And then we see Jesus as the Savior of all mankind. 1 Timothy 1.15. This is a trustworthy saying, and everyone should accept it. If you write in your Bibles, underline that. Paul says that a couple of different times in this letter, and it's things that he really wants to emphasize. So this is really important. And in this case, what he's saying is, Christ Jesus came into the world, why? To save sinners. And then Paul says, and I'm the worst of them all. I think we probably all could say that. Paul acknowledged that Jesus came for a specific purpose. He came to save sinners. He came to save you and I. He came to seek and save the lost. Then in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 3 and 4, this is good and pleases God our Savior, who wants everyone to be saved and to understand the truth. Everyone to be saved and everyone to understand the truth. So who did Jesus come to save? He came to save everyone. No one is left out of his plan to save the world. Again, in 1 Timothy 2, 5 and 6, there's one God and one mediator who can reconcile God and humanity, the man Jesus Christ. Paul is recognizing this great chasm between us and God. The chasm is our sinful nature, our sinfulness, but he said that there's, there's one person who can reconcile God and humanity, the man Christ Jesus. He gave his life to purchase freedom for everyone, Paul says. And in 1 Timothy 4.10, it says, This is why we work hard and we continue to struggle. Why we persevere in our struggles. For our hope is in the living God, who is the Savior of all people, and particularly of all believers. Next, Paul speaks to the doctrine of the church. And this is without a doubt the main doctrinal issue in the book of 1 Timothy. In 1 Timothy 3, 14 and 15, Paul says... I am writing these things to you now, even though I hope to be with you soon, so that if I am delayed, you will know, here it is, how the people must conduct themselves in the house of God. This is the church of the living God, which is the pillar and foundation of the truth. One of the reasons that Paul wrote this letter is that just in case he was delayed, that the people there would know how they needed to conduct themselves in the church. It's a very clear statement of why Paul wrote this letter to Timothy. And as a pastor, as a shepherd myself, I wish that everyone who considers themselves a part of this church could be here to hear what the church really is. See, the church is not a building. It's not the pastor. It's not the church staff. Scripture clearly defines that the church of the living God is a church of living people. And what that means is you are the church. You and I, we make up the church. The church is God's people. It's not programs. It's not facilities. It's not just the leaders of the church. And there are so many misconceptions about the church, even in church circles today. So we're going to plan on this for a minute. We're going to kind of explore 
together what Paul had to say about the church and look at it from the perspective of our church. Now, Paul calls the church the pillar and foundation of the truth. And what does that mean exactly, the pillar and the foundation? Well, foundation means ground or grounding. So the church is grounded in the truth. It's the solid support structure on which the Word of God can rest. It's the church's job to uphold the Word of God. That's what's being said. If a church is not upholding the Word of God, I would say it's really not functioning like a church of God at all. It's not. The church should be immovable, infallible in its support of God's Word. But it's also called a pillar. And this word adds depth to the definition of it. Listen to what English theologian Matthew Poole said. He said, pillars were used in ancient times to fasten upon them any public edicts which princes or courts would have published. And what that did was it exposed them to the view of all the people. Hence, the church is called the pillar and the basis are the seal of truth because by it the truths of God are published, supported, and defended. Published, supported, and defended. See, that's what the church does with the truths of God. So here's what the church is, according to Paul. The church, by design, is a group of people who come together as a foundation or a platform from which the Word of God is displayed. The church is a billboard, if you will, that holds the words high for all to see. The Word of God. In the church, the Word of God should be central. And that's a distinctive of Calvary Chapel churches around the country. As a group of people called to Coastline Calvary Chapel, you and I, we're very obviously sharing that passion for God's Word. If you don't share that kind of passion for God's Word, you probably come in the front door and go out the back. You know, that's what we do week in and week out is teach the Word of God. There's always room for improvement, but I think we as a church do that very, very well. But that's not all a church is. In the context of Scripture, as God's people, you and I follow a model that's laid out in Acts chapter 2. We pray together. We worship God together. We enjoy this thing called fellowship as we gather together. And we remember that our sins were erased once and for all time by the blood of Jesus. It's Acts 2.42. It says there, And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread and in prayers. And listen, while we're not a social hall, I do believe that the church of God fills a critical role in meeting certain social needs in our community. I mean, we see that through the ministry of Jesus and his disciples. We see as we look through the Gospels where people were fed that didn't have food, where widows' needs were provided for where sick people were prayed for, and then they were healed. Now, is the church still involved in providing for the needs of the community? I would say so. Absolutely we are. And I can only speak for us, for our church. But let me give you just a few examples of of just some things we do, just a couple of examples. Corporately, we get together and we care for the people of our community through a monthly food drive that stocks a local food pantry. Now, the food out of that food pantry is distributed right here in our community, so we participate in that. 
We support the Waterfront Rescue Mission. And through their ministry, they provide for the needs of those many times who are overlooked in our community, sometimes even shunned by our community. We support Safe Harbor Pregnancy Resource Center. It's an organization that provides free and confidential services to women and to families who discover a new pregnancy in their life. And through that, we support the biblical pro-life stance. See, we're people helping people in the name of Jesus. As God leads and guides us because we're moved with compassion. We see all throughout Jesus' life how he was moved with compassion, and we are too. But more than anything else, listen, the church must, as Calvary Chapel founder Chuck Smith said, simply teach the Bible simply. We simply teach the Bible simply. We don't need great orators. I'm thankful for that. We don't need dynamic speakers, although it doesn't hurt to have one. You know, I very often tell people we have two of the best expository teachers of God's Word right here at Coastline Calvary Chapel. We do. Pastors John and Neil, they teach the Word week in and week out. What we need is men who will become students of Scripture and teach what they've learned to other people. And that's what we have in those two guys. They've learned it. They've done it. They've studied it. And they teach it to us on a regular basis. So Paul says to Timothy in chapter 4, verse 13, he said, Timothy, until I get there, focus on reading the Scriptures to the church. Just read the Scriptures to the church encouraging the believers and teaching them what those scriptures say. What's the doctrine of the church? Simply stated, the church of God should be all about the Word of God. See, more than anything else, that's the charge from our founder, Jesus Christ. That's what he says to do. Another doctrinal matter that Paul writes to his son in the faith about is called godliness. Now, Paul uses this word godliness nine times in 1 Timothy, 11 times in the entirety of the pastoral epistles, and he doesn't use it in any of his other letters. And what that tells me is that it's a focus of 1 Timothy that we need to pay attention to. So in chapter 4, verses 7 and 8, Paul says to Timothy, do not waste your time arguing over godless ideas and old wives' tales. Instead, train yourself to be godly. Train yourself in that. Physical training is good, but training for godliness is much better, promising benefits in this life and in the life to come. So you got to ask the question, what is godliness? Well, for our purposes this morning, godliness is a lifestyle of devotion to God. It's a lifestyle of devotion to God. Who remembers a guy named Enoch from the Old Testament? Any of you guys recognize that name? Enoch was an interesting guy. Genesis chapter 5 is a documentation of the human race from the first man, Adam, up until the time of Noah. And in verse 21, we see a lot of what the Bible has to say about this guy named Enoch. When Enoch was 65 years old, he became the father of Methuselah. And after the birth of Methuselah, Enoch lived in close fellowship with God for another 300 years. And he had other sons and daughters. Enoch lived 365 years, walking in close fellowship with God, and then one day he disappeared because God took him. Now, we get a little bit more information on Enoch in the New Testament in the book of Hebrews. Uh, Hebrews chapter 11 is known as the Hall of Faith in Scripture because it has some examples of remarkable faith 
in the lives of God's people. And in verse 5, the writer says this, It was by faith that Enoch was taken up to heaven without dying. He disappeared because God took him. For before he was taken up, he was known as a person who pleased God. And there are two very distinct statements about the life of Enoch in these few verses. First of all, he walked in close fellowship with God, and he purposed in his heart to please God. So how do you measure the kind of devotion that leads to godliness? How do you produce godliness in your life? Well, two lessons from Enoch. First, you spend time with God, and then you spend time pleasing God. You make that a central purpose of your life. It's living your life in such a way that you've surrendered every aspect of it to God. It's that song, I Surrender All. I love the new version of it this morning that Rob taught to us. Next doctrinal matter. This is number four for your outline if you're taking notes. Paul is not identifying or teaching on the roles of men and women here in society. And that's the theme that we're looking at, the roles of men and women in the church. He really wants to be clear that what he's doing is defining these roles and responsibilities for when the church comes together, when the people of God come together publicly under the authority of Jesus Christ, Here's what the church should look like. First of all, 1 Timothy chapter 2, beginning in verse 8. So whenever you assemble, I want men to pray with holy hands, lifted up to God, free from anger and controversy. Context here is very important. Just reading through that, we wouldn't get it, but in the culture of that day, when men were engaged in controversy with someone else, or when they were angry with someone, they would frequently lift their hands to kind of display what was going on inside of them. Those inward feelings would come out through raised hands. So Paul takes something that they're very familiar with, and he uses it here, as kind of an illustration. He redeems it, if you will. Paul says, men, we should pray with holy hands lifted to God. And I don't really think Paul was concerned about the posture of prayer as much as he was the attitude, the condition of our hearts when we pray. See, with hands raised high to heaven, in my mind, portrays an attitude of total surrender. And you know, it's interesting when a guy gets older, what things go through his mind and just kind of seem okay. Uh, much to my wife's dismay, I am the proud owner at 64 years old of a new motorcycle. Middle-aged crazy, now I'm well beyond middle age. It's not that kind of thing. And it's not really a motorcycle, it's a scooter, if you know what that is. And I've already been pulled over twice on my new scooter. <laughs> and what do you do when you get pulled over on a scooter? I mean, just by riding the scooter, you're already humbled, right? Right? My wife, Anna, calls it my hog, <laughs> like it's some big motorcycle. And she always asks me when I come in, does that make you feel like a man? <laughs> Absolutely not. Doesn't do that for me. But when I get pulled over, this, this picture of surrender comes into my mind. Now, I haven't had to assume the position yet. The stops have been kind of courtesy things, just checking on me. Guys out at the beach stopped me just to see what I was riding. But here's the thing, guys. That's our attitude before the Lord when we come to Him in prayer. We're humble. 
Our hands are lifted high because we're surrendering to him. That's the picture. We're saying to him, not, not my will, Lord, but your will be done. We come with a broken spirit. We come with a contrite heart. But listen, gentlemen, we come. Man, we need to come often to the Lord in prayer. And the next topic is women in the church. Oh my gosh, look at the time. <laughs> Woo. Here it is. Paul's instructions regarding women in the church. When the church come to, comes together, Paul said, be modest in your appearance. That's the first thing that he says to women. Wear decent and appropriate clothing. Don't draw attention to yourself. If you want to make yourselves attractive, do it by the things that you do. That's how you make yourself attractive. Let the good and godly attributes that God has placed in each one of you kind of come out in right living. Man, great picture there. But Paul doesn't stop there. He goes in for more. Paul goes on to say, learn quietly and submissively, not teaching men or having authority over them. Paul's words, not mine. But listen, it helps to remember the context here. Paul is talking about God's design for the church. Paul's not representing himself either. Now, does that mean that women shouldn't teach in the church? Of course not. Women are encouraged to teach other women in the church. Specifically, the older women are, are encouraged to teach younger women in the church. They have a huge responsibility to teach, specifically at this time, in their homes, as the women were the ones that raised the children of the family. So they taught the Bible in that context. And listen, today, they fill many other roles, equally important roles, as the body of Christ comes together corporately. So here's the bottom line from Paul. He says, women, when you come together as a church in a public setting, gather with an attitude of faith, love, holiness, and modesty. And I don't think any of us would disagree with that. And here's the funny thing about that. I looked into the upcoming teaching schedule. Pastor Neil kind of schedules who's going to teach on what day. And he assigned this particular section of Scripture on women in the church, 1 Timothy chapter 2, to his father. And I think that's real wisdom on Neil's part. So we have three more doctrines to get through, and we're going to do it very quickly. We'll hit on them, and then we'll be drawing to a close. The first is the matter of the pulpit, and more specifically, protection of what's being taught from the pulpit. Uh, first look at chapter 1, beginning with verse 3. When I left for Macedonia, I urged you, Timothy, to stay there in Ephesus and stop those whose teaching is contrary to the truth. Don't let them waste their time in endless discussions of myths and spiritual pedigrees. These things only lead to meaningless speculations, which don't help people live a life of faith in God. The purpose of my instruction, important, here's one of the purposes of Paul's writing to Timothy. The purpose of my instruction is that all believers would be filled with love that comes from a pure heart, a clear conscience, and genuine faith. Man, if you want to take something with you from this morning, take that. Paul said, I wish that all believers would be filled with love that comes from a pure heart, a clear conscience, and a genuine faith. Then in chapter 4, beginning with verse 1, 
Paul says, now the Holy Spirit tells us clearly that in the last time some will turn away from the true faith. They will follow deceptive spirits and teachings that come from demons. Paul is telling Timothy to protect the pulpit against false teaching and against false teachers. Just as we discussed that the church is the support or the foundation to hold up and broadcast the Word of God, the pulpit is the conduit from which the Word of God is shared. Now, I don't know what your church involvement was before you came to Coastline, but I am so thankful that we have a pastoral heritage here. First in John Spencer and now in Pastor Neil that protects the pulpit. It protects God's people. It protects you and I. It's a responsibility that they share and that they both take very, very seriously. And that's in our best interest. Next, leadership in the church. You might want to jot this one down. 1 Timothy 3, 1 through 13. I'm not going to read through that. But in these verses, Paul establishes the framework of church leadership in Two offices are positions, elders and deacons. So the elders lead and teach, and the deacons kind of do the work of the ministry. They serve in the ministry. At Coastline, we use the names pastor to describe those who lead and teach. These are our elders and bishops in the language of all the New Testament letters. And we use servant leader to describe our deacons, those who serve in the ministry, those who do the work of the ministry. Same roles, same qualifications that are given here, just names that are more familiar to our culture. And while Paul identifies the positions of church leadership and also goes through the criteria necessary to qualify for one of those positions... He falls short of giving anything explicit as far as details regarding the governance of the church. So that's not discussed here. And the last of these doctrinal matters the Apostle Paul shares with Timothy is widows in the church. And 1 Timothy 5, 3 through 8 identifies these women by saying the church should care for any widow who has no one else to care for her. And then in verse 5, some really beautiful language used here to describe these saints. But a woman who is a true widow, one who is truly alone in the world, has placed her hope in God. Night and day she asks God for help and she spends much time in prayer. And I've got to be honest, when I read through that, I couldn't help but think of a, a couple of ladies that have been involved in the life of our church, Murda Squathney and Maud Weeks. I mean, those are two widows who were saints in our church and now they're saints in heaven with Jesus. But while they're here, man, they were, they were praying. They were loving on people. They were still very actively involved in the life of our church as much as they could be and specifically in ways that they could be. And I think that's very important. And so with that, my goal is complete. We're finished for the morning. You know the backstory on 1 Timothy now, hopefully. And pretty much to a lesser degree, the backstory for 2 Timothy as well. And I hope that you'll come back next week again as Pastor Neil will start teaching verse by verse through this important letter in Scripture with chapter 1, verse 1. 